So I'm here with Brenton Langle, the anarchist playwright, comic book writer, and we're just going to kind of go over his recent uh, debate with the strange French racial pseudoscience white supremacist. Uh, uh, what's his name again? Uh, J.F. Uh, Garaipe, or I, th I'm, I still have no idea how to pronounce his last name. <laughs> well, you, uh, you blew him out of the water. He was not <laughs> expecting that. Um, wow, my goodness. Um, I, you know, I mean, it was, it was, geez, I mean, you just had him, you had him, uh, I mean, he didn't know what he was in for. I mean, he tried to pull it all on you and you were prepared. I mean, I guess he doesn't have much more. I mean, he has a typical song and dance that he does, but, uh, beyond that, there's not much there. What do you make of it? I mean, I think he's used to relying on his degree to intimidate people. Um, into like agreeing with what he has to say or giving him the benefit of the doubt when he's spewing bullshit. Um, like, uh, but you saw what happened when his credentials were actually challenged when I pointed out that like his thesis, for instance, was in like the electrical signals in the brains of lampreys and that he had, like he said, he says, I do brain surgery. Yeah. He did brain surgery on monkeys. Um, so like, the the thing is, and that's impressive, but also he, he the studies that he like almost none of the studies that are attributed to him. He is not the primary author on any of them. He's just one person contributing to them. So, you know, the, the, the thing is, is that if you don't have a scientific background or in my case, if you don't have friends who are in uh, the met, high up in the medical and science worlds, um, you can get intimidated just by, oh, man, you know, this guy has a degree in neuroscience. He worked at Duke University and not really look into that. And even if you look at like other debunkings of him, you know, sometimes they focused on his personal life and the, the speculation about what may or may not have happened at Duke University or, um, you know, pointing out what happened with uh, the, the girl in Texas. Uh, which I'm not going to bring up on here because, you know, like I said, we don't really know. We know the facts of the case, but that's about it. Um, but like th that's the stuff that like I think Destiny and Vouch have brought up. Uh, what I did was I know a neuroscientist. Uh, I also know a guy who is a um, research biologist who is employed at one of the biggest and most important la like labs in New York City. He may be working on coronavirus right now for all I know. He was working to cure cancer last time. And uh, I reached out to them and a few other friends and I showed them uh, Garipe's uh, research. And I was like, is this guy legit? Can he talk about race? And they looked at it and said, absolutely not he he's the the thing is is that people make this mistake where they think if you're smart one way you're smart in every way and if you're educated in one part of science you're educated in all parts of science but the fact is is that neuroscience is not genetics and these even the specific type of neuroscience that he majored in and that he like and where his body of work is it's just has it has absolutely nothing to do with what he's put himself forward as as an expert in. and the only reason it flies is he's talking with a bunch of you know brain dead racists yeah. Why is there such a desire to revive racial pseudoscience now? I mean, that's that stuff fell out of fashion, at least after the Second World War, if not before. It's been so widely debunked. I mean, what what is it that this is the latest Internet trend is we're going to try to do studies to prove some races are superior to others? Um, and let me get there's a quote, actually. Uh, hang on. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, that I love that takes this one, uh, yeah, transcending our differences. So there's a couple of reasons that I, I think this is happening. Um, the first of which is is that this has been going on for quite a long time. In his debate with Vouch that I watched to prepare for uh, the debate that we did, um, he like when Vouch told him like there were no credible scientists or academians who would do this. Like he mentioned uh, this guy who uh, Edward Dutton. Who yeah. uh, and I, I, the name jumped out, and I was like, "Wait, what the hell is going?" On? And uh, what had happened was someone uh, had reached out to Modern Day Debate and suggested that I debate Edward Dutton. And I'm like, "Who the hell is Edward Dutton? Why should I look at this?" And I googled the guy, and the thing is, is that I just laughed it off the screen. Um, what happens? It's this Edward Dutton guy. Essentially, uh, is a he's the editor for what is called Mankind Quarterly. Mankind Quarterly is a is like a fake uh, eugenicist 
so it's, it, it's, it's a eugenicist organization that publishes fake scientific research and fallacious scientific research. Uh, it was literally started by the mentor of Dr. Mengele. And it's still around and, you know, it looks fairly, you know, respectable. But, you know, like I looked at the guy and they're like, oh, you should debate this guy on race. And then I looked at that guy's degree and his degree is in frickin' theology. Like he's an entertainer. <laughs> I've seen some of his material. He's an entertainer. He starts his videos dressed up in a costume, uh, mm -hmm. doing his impression of somebody. And then he talks. And uh, his whole big thing is he argues that leftists are mutants. Uh, that's his big <laughs> talking point. Um, and that... Uh, you know, that the traditional hierarchies are good and that burning witches was good because it prevented them from breeding and they were genetically defective. And it's it's just really hateful stuff. Um, but it's delivered with this kind of tongue in cheek, stiff upper lip, British accent kind of it's it's yeah, very, very yeah. strange. I mean, I can see the charisma that he has, but it's really dangerous stuff, really offensive stuff. And it doesn't have scientific credibility. Um, so I guess this JF character is is a Duttonite, where I guess. I, I mean, he mentioned him. I think a lot of them cluster around this Mankind Quarterly, um, which is uh, funded by the Pioneer Fund, which is another like neo-Nazi, uh, like nonprofit organization that funnels money through to do all this stuff. And I think that this has been around for, you know, uh, decades, if not longer. You know, like I said, the, the, the uh, Mankind Quarterly was started by Dr. Mengele's literal, um, like, mentor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, the eugenicist movement was pretty big, and there's still some things, you know, there's still some tendrils of that holding on to our society, and they've just reemerged because of the internet. Uh, but also, I think the, pro the problem goes deeper, and that's why I wanted to find this quote by Daisaku Ikeda, uh, who is the president of Soka Gakkai, my Buddhist organization. He says, The roots of racism run deep. Movements to fan racial hatred for political, economic, or religious advantage are always with us. The seriousness of this problem lies in that it is too closely tied to people's spiritual and emotional desires. In other words, we might say that the desire for an identity, to know where one came from and where one is going, lies at the root of racism. People cannot withstand a vacuum of ideas. A philosophical and ideological void drives people to seek their identity in their race. So, you know, as capitalism uh, has destroyed traditional families, you know, traditional ways of life all over the world, um, as, um, you know, the Enlightenment destroyed our ways of organizing through religion, um, people feel lost. They feel, uh, you know, they, they feel trapped. They feel cut off and atomized. And this is very good for, you know, the people who run our society for the elites, because when people are isolated, uh, you know, they Ha they're more dependent on those elites and they're more dependent on the system. Um, you know, like the, the fascists will talk about families and stuff and how important families are. Yeah. Families are crazy important, but you'll notice that we live in the nuclear family now, as opposed to like the lar larger extended families and clan based uh, stuff. And I, the reason we do that in a big, in a big way is that like that's convenient for capitalism children yeah. are shamed if they still live with their parents um you know one one big family living together and pooling resources in a small place you only need one table you only need a couple refrigerators you can keep everything together there but if you break out families and you shame people for um you know not living on their own with 2.5 kids a mortgage uh you know a house uh with a white picket fence that's so many different products that everyone has to buy it's a lot of redundancy in the economy well, it's interesting. I was just recently reading, I finally got my hands on the prison notebooks of Antonio Gramsci, which is this big thing for Marxist academia. And I mean, I'm, I'm used to reading Marx and Lenin and William Z. Foster and Soviet textbooks and stuff. So I figured, but this is big among the, the Marxist academia crowd. So I figured I should read it. Uh, but, you know, Antonio Gramsci, you know, Italian Marxist who was in prison, he has an essay called Americanism and Fordism. And he talks about, he talks about the Taylor, you know, the Taylor, Taylorism, this, you know, you know, making production highly efficient. He talks about how Henry Ford was like controlling the lives of his workers and like firing them if they got divorced or if they, you know, were drinking too much alcohol and stuff like that. And he talks about basically how this, you know, this, this kind of traditional family emphasis and this Puritanism that really arose, started in Britain long before it came mm -hmm. to the United States, but it became associated with the United States and the public mind, that that was actually just about making people effective factory workers. 
right? Like that's yeah. really all it was about, right? Um, it was, you know, they wanted, they actually banned alcohol in the United States. They had prohibition because if you drink too much, your ability to work harder on the assembly line is not going to be, you know, as good, right? And then if you strictly regulate people's sexual practices, they're going to have a lot more nervous energy and that makes them more effective on the assembly line. And that, that really, you know, that a lot of this conventional morality that was being pushed by the British and by the United States was just about making people, putting people on an assembly line and making it so that when they were on that assembly line, they would churn out the best. They would just, they would churn out the best. And then giving them that white picket fence household, you know, I mean, it was about, it was about making people as productive as possible. It makes you think about the, uh, the matrix when uh, Morpheus holds up that battery and says, you've been turned into this, right? And then yeah. it, it, it's not really about the Bible. It's not about morality. It's not about this is the one true way to be. And, and this is the, no, it's just about, this is something capitalists figured out about making people into very, very profitable, you know, institutions. I thought that was very fascinating that Gramsci talks about that um, in, in his essay. And I think that kind of, kind of alludes to what a lot of these folks don't quite get. The conservatism is very manufactured, you know, the, this idea that there is, you know, I used to, I remember going back to when I was in Ohio, I remember that the evangelicals used to have a bumper sticker, marriage equals one man plus one woman, right? Uh, one man plus one woman equals marriage. Well, the thing is, if you actually read the Bible, Abraham had multiple wives, Moses had multiple wives, all the great prophets of the Old Testament had many, many wives. So actually, marriage equals one man plus many, many wives. <laughs> Until the New Testament, all of a sudden they have monogamy because Jewish law and Jewish culture changed. I mean, it's just, you know, so, I mean, it's ridiculous, right? This idea that there's this one sacred, holy way a family should be, that's just not in touch with reality. Now, and people ask me, didn't Marx say he wanted to destroy the family? Well, I think what Marx was saying, if you read, especially Engels' Origin of the Private Property and the State, is that things like families evolve and change over time. And that, that we need to get past this idea that there's one sacred way of doing things that we cannot stray from. I mean, do you, yeah, would you and it, that? Absolutely. And I mean, like... You know, you're married. I'm married with a child. It's uh, it, it, it's so weird because we always get accused of like wanting to destroy the family and wanting to disrupt family roots because it's one they're stupid, uh, but also two it's it's a fairly good slam. Like it's disingenuous, but it's you know people do need their families. Family is incredibly important, um, and so and it's especially you know when people are constantly kept on the edge when you know um, before covid and I, i'm sure it's gotten even worse now you know americans did not have enough money in their pockets for like a, a 400 dollar emergency um and would have to go into debt in the event that they had to do that um you know i, I think what what's important to remember also is that like the society's back in the time that like Marx was writing about this were so much more heavily regimented than they are today. Um, like, I mean, in Spain, I remember like it was illegal for women to go anywhere unescorted. It was like Saudi Arabia, you know, like with, with the Saudis where they're, they're not allowed to drive on their own or something, or I, maybe they changed that recently. I don't know. Well, no, I mean, and, and Gramsci talks about how, you know, in Italy at the time he's writing, to be an adult, a man or a woman, and not have children was considered to be a very shameful person in society to the point that, like, you know, people wouldn't speak to you and such. And it was just considered your duty as a human being was to have children. And if you made the choice not to do that, if you didn't get married or you got married and didn't have kids, you were considered to be kind of a pariah, like people wouldn't want to associate with you and stuff. And that's I mean, that's weird, right? I mean, if people want to have children, they should have children. If they don't want to have children, they shouldn't. I mean, and, and but, you know, when there's this kind of, there, there was a lot more social pressure. It was like people's lives were much more regimented. You will grow up, you will do this, you will, you know, and I think that's changing as society changes. Um, I think that that's kind of what these folks don't get. And that, that Marxism was saying that things didn't have to be that closely regulated and that, that the regulations that do exist serve an economic base. They're not, you know, pointing toward eternal traditional truths. Um, you know, Julius Evola, the, the big fascist thinker, his writing, he spends, and it's weird because he goes all through the writings of, you know, ancient Buddhists and ancient, you know, Tibetans, and, you know, he goes into Africa, and it's like, it's like he's going through the world's religions, trying to find the one sacred truth that exists. And I, it's kind of a foolish thing to do because there is no one sacred truth, right? I mean, all of Certainly the not. They evolve and change based on different circumstances. But yeah, I'm glad you did that debate. I mean, he was not prepared for that. And, uh, <laughs> you know, um, at one point he was talking to you. He's like, oh, I, you know, I, I, 
you know, I, I, when you, uh, what was he said? He said, I'm sorry that you went through that arrest. That was traumatic. Like, <laughs> he didn't even quite get what you were saying. He was just, oh, I'm sorry that you got arrested for Brent. You know, I mean, it was just, it was, that was odd. And he wants to build a community. Yeah. He wants to be separate all by himself. I mean, what's weird is Stryker and uh, Enoch and these other like Nazi kind of types, they openly, you know, they have a collectivist view, right? They're not in favor of capitalism. He's just a libertarian. He just adds racism into the mix, right? I mean, that's, yeah. that's kind of, you know, and that seems to be the more prevailing viewpoint if you look at most of these right-wing demagogues on the internet is they, they have a, a right-wing analysis of capitalism and, and all of that. The enemy is, of course, communists. You, you know, they called you a communist how many times in the debate? Communist, you know, you know, you know, and so, uh, which was just so weird. It, apparently, the debate had labeled me as a communist and him as yeah. a as a libertarian, which I was actually really mad about because, like, one, when you don't know, like like average Joe, Joe average goes in there and sees libertarian and communist. They're going to think that the freaking fascist is closer to where they are just because yeah. they've heard the word libertarian more often. They may not know many communists. I really thought it would have been better if it had been like, I don't know, race realist and egalitarian or something. Um, yeah, you, know. you weren't arguing economics. No, no. And it kept, uh, it was, I was so weirded out. Cause I was like, why does he keep bringing up communism? <laughs> Like you got, you saw me at that moment where I just had to be like, dude, ad hominem, ad hominem, ad hominem. When he just went down this like line of like slams against hypothetical fat beer drinking communists. Um, I don't know. Like the, the whole thing was very bizarre. Um, I, I thought that uh, one of the things that I also wanted to bring up that I noticed, and this you might have seen this when he tried, like when I really pissed him off by going after his credentials, um, he tried really hard to like hit me on the like, you're going to die <laughs> and you will have not created something like this book, this freaking self-published Amazon book that he did. Um by the way, I showed his book to the neuroscientist that um, uh, I was working with, and the guy looked at it, and he said, okay, well, I haven't read it, but everything that he's talking about here, this is stuff the scientific community has been aware of for years. He's just trying to popularize something someone else thought up. Um, so, And that that's just based upon like reading the, the Amazon description. So, you know, the thing is, I have said this before, and I, I'm going to say it again. Um, I really think that there are a couple of problems here, one of which is that fascism and people looking to, for instance, uh, pull meaning from race. Another big problem with this is, I think, the fear of death, the uh, the anxiety that comes on upon realizing that one's own inevitable, um, you know, uh, annihilation, because, you know, we're all going to die. And he seemed to think that there were two paths out of this, two paths to immortality. Uh, one was via the race and his genetic component in it and why he was so obsessed with, like, the the race to keep your genes in the gene pool. Um, and the other was, like, he was like, oh, people are going to be reading my book for a million years. And no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, but, like, the thing is, is even if, let's say, even if that happened, one, he's going to be dead so he's not going to be around to experience that so that means nothing except for you know a little and you know like when i was early in my career before i'd finished like my early plays i remember you know early 20s um my a friend of mine had died and one of the things i was like was i've got to get this play out i've got to finish this play um before you know before i die because i need to I, I need to do something i have this this work this art inside of me and i finished that play and i got it out and I went whoo okay i guess i can die now <laughs> and um you know, but that's something that I worked through many, many years ago um, by hiking the Appalachian Trail, uh, by becoming a Buddhist, by, you know, um, I, I got comfortable with the annihilation of myself and everything that I do and everything that's going to happen. Like, yeah, no matter what any of us do, our genetic lines will be wiped out. No matter what any of us do, our works will not endure forever. And I think it's this – there's a, a video, if you watch like 8-Bit uh, Philosophy, it's called like the, the uh, Philosophy of Darth Vader. And it goes into like um, how fear of death can drive people to kill off the human parts of themselves and to try to master death by bringing it to others. And it really uh, it 
put I really think that that can be put into the fascist will towards like violence. And you talked about um, what, what's the guy who was constantly talking about uh, violence? Um, oh, Evola? I mean, Sorel. Uh, I mean, that seems to be a theme in all of the fascist writing is this obsession with violence, making people heroic. Violence is the answer. But, you know, I mean, Mussolini's, you know, autobiography, just, you know, history weren't did the wheels of history turn, but through blood. And then, you know, the problem with the Italian Socialist Party, well, they weren't violent enough. Uh, you know, the problem with the anarchists, they weren't violent enough. Only he understood how important violence was. Violence is the answer. There's the Futurist Manifesto. I guess there was this artistic mm-hmm. movement called the Futurists in Italy. Yeah. Uh, that, 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 that was kind of influenced by Marxism, but ultimately became pro-fascist. And they were, you read their manifesto, it's all about violence. Violence, violence, violence is the answer. Um, it's very, very odd, right? And then that's what people associate with communism. Whereas I always point out that responsible revolutionaries have always advocated a peaceful transition towards socialism, right? This, yeah. this, this obsession with violence as if violence in and of itself is a spiritual act that purifies the soul. And I mean, that, that's, that's just, that's deranged thinking. I mean, that's, that's kind of the philosophy of school shooters, I would think, right? I mean, that's the philosophy of mass murderers. Um, yeah, I mean, it absolutely is. Well, you know, I read uh, The Doctrine of Fascism um, by Giovanni Gentile because, you know, the f- fascists who try to act like they have a intellectual core will sometimes uh, a- a- appeal to him. And we've talked about it a little bit. But one of the things that I noticed that was direct contra- – w- which was in direct contradiction to the whole idealism thing was it was talking about like how man needed a place in history. Uh-huh. And I, I even said this uh, on the the in the debate at one point because he was talking about history and his need to connect with it. Uh, and I, you hear it; it gets cut off a little bit. But I said, I said, history is just a story. And really, I mean, that's what it is. It's a story. We have a record of events that happened. We're trying to understand them. So, like, to to tie your happiness. And to tie your personhood and your success to having a place in history is inherently dangerous and stupid Um, because suddenly everything that you're doing is not for yourself. You're not living in the moment. You're not being happy. You're not taking care of the people around you. You're, you're thinking about, Oh, what's my legacy going to be in the history books? And I guarantee you in the event that, you know, you do do something that winds up in the history books. Great. It, it, the people who put it into those books are going to get it wrong and <laughs> it's going well, to be put into other contexts. Yeah. There's a famous quote. Uh, it's been said that uh, history would be a great thing if it were true. Uh, but more than that, we know Winston Churchill, he said that history will be good to us because I intend to write it. Um, and that's, that's what he said. So, I mean, and, and the more you look at it, the more you realize that in a lot of ways, history, great works of history are written for the present, right? They're written to address issues in the present. I mean, the founding fathers of the United States were deeply, deeply influenced by the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. That was a mm-hmm. book in eight different volumes. Every single one of the founding fathers read it. You'll notice that in Washington, D.C., the, the streets are almost designed to look like Rome. Upstate New York, all these names, all these Italian and Greek named cities, because it was like this obsession. Well, why were the founding fathers, you know, you know, thousands of years later, obsessed with the fall of Rome? Well, it was because of the Roman Republic, right? And it was about the question of the Republican government, elected leaders. It was the question of, of, you know, why do civilizations fall and new empires and the Enlightenment and questioning the the Christendom that had laid the basis for feudalism and looking deeper back and arguing that perhaps there was something wrong with the the post-Roman Roman feudal Christian order that emerged and led by the Catholic Church in Europe. It was about dealing with issues in their time. It wasn't they weren't just, you know, really into Roman history. It was addressing things in their time. And I think great works of history generally do that. Right. There's a reason that that books come out. Right. Um, mm-hmm. you know, there was a, There's huge... a reason everybody's obsessed with Hamilton now, because, yeah. you know, it is, the nation is losing its sense of itself. And so it's it's looking to, um, I guess, synthesize uh, both like a more modern, multicultural, urban way of life with the founding fathers. Sure. And and Hamilton was an economist and there's huge economic problems right now. Hamilton was the economist of the United States. And one of his big things was infrastructure. He, you know, he realized how important the lighthouses were, that if the United States was going to be economically prosperous, it needed to have lighthouses. Right. And he had the government. Oh, my gosh, spend money. Oh, my gosh. 
to build lighthouses all up and down the East Coast so that when ships came here, they would be safe and people would trade. Um, you know, I mean, he was all into government spending on infrastructure. That was an influence later on Roosevelt and others. You know, I mean, Hamilton wasn't a communist or a socialist. And I think that some people go a little too far with the Hamilton worship. He just understood that you need some level of economic control. And his ideas are very similar to the, uh, the teachings of the, the German economist. I'm trying to remember his name the big German economist that Marx didn't particularly take seriously. Um, Friedrich List, right? Friedrich List. Um, there's Henry Carey in the United States. And it was before the rise of imperialism and before banks became central, when there was industrial capitalism first, and then there was, you know, there, there was, you know, a decaying feudalism, when there were just kind of factory owners. This notion that there could be a harmony of interests, that you'd have a government that would balance the interests of the workers and the capitalists and work in the interest of the nation state overall. Uh, that was the kind of the economic ideas that were very popular, uh, and they were swept away uh, with, with the rise when you had global monopoly corporations spreading all over the world. That wasn't going to work anymore. But, you know, that was an influence on Lincoln. Uh, that was an influence on, uh, on a lot of different people. And then in, in the 30s, when you had fascism, a lot of the fascists were these industrialists. They were factory owners who didn't like bankers, right? And they, they framed in that anti-Semitic way. And so you saw the Nazi state attempting to glorify Friedrich List. Um, and all of that. And so there, there was an attempt to sign to say, well, well, you know, factory owners are better than bankers. Bankers are Jews. Factory owners are patriotic members of the nation. So it fit into this kind of fascist narrative that developed. Um, I know the Nazis made a documentary glorifying Friedrich List. Um, so it, it, it's all very, very confusing. But yeah, Hamilton was just somebody who believed that the U.S. government had a responsibility to kind of oversee the economy, regulate banking, build lighthouses, and kind of facilitate economic development in the United States. And he did a pretty good job of it. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the United States broke off from the British. It wasn't going to be part of the British global financial empire. So how was the United States going to develop? Well, it needed to have its own kind of economy and it needed state management to do it. And now it we have this, the infrastructure. <laughs> yeah, we need, and we have this libertarian perspective now that the government should just keep its hands off. And that's what people believe about the United States. They believe that no one ever did that. The United States is so great because it's just a mess of pioneers. It's the Wild West. Like that other libertarian we had a debate with who said that the Wild West was so great. And that's actually not true, that in the early years of the United States, there was a lot of economic management. If the state hadn't levied taxes and, and built lighthouses and, and regulated and put tariffs and regulated interstate commerce and all of that, uh, there, wouldn't have been, uh, there wouldn't have been the situation that, that led to the United States economically prospering. Um, so, but I mean, but, and, and it's all a little bit dangerous too, because let's, let's remember that one of the grievances of the founding fathers was they wanted to go and plunder and, you know, kill all the native Americans all over the country. Whereas, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whereas the British had drawn this line with the French and said, okay, you can't go past it here. And we're not, you know, they, they, they really didn't see the United States economically prospering into an own, its own economic power. They saw the United States as being another little territory in their empire. And, uh, the founding fathers of the United States, they wanted to have their own, mega economy in the United States. And so it was a it was a clash of economic interests. The founding fathers were just as racist. The founding fathers were just as colonialist in their mindset. They just didn't like being held back by a, a bigger empire that had bigger interests. You know, it's it's very interesting that you bring that up. Um, and it, it just jogged my memory because there is um, another there's a great quote, actually, by the um, Shawnee chief Tecumseh. Um, and when I was younger, actually, I performed in a play about his life, actually, up in Chillicothe, Ohio. Um, which... Wow, I might have seen you because I went to that play when I was a kid. <laughs> oh, you did? Yeah, so I was maybe there. I saw you in it. So go on. <laughs> You so might have. On. Yeah. Um, but so when I was in that play, actually, they had a, a bit of this. But um, what I really thought was interesting about this is um, here we go. Uh, Brother, I wish you would take p pity on the red people and do as I have requested. If you will not give up the land and do cross the boundary of our present settlement, it will be very hard to produce and produce great trouble between us. The way, the only way to stop this evil is for the red people to unite in claiming a common and equal right to the land as it was at first it sh and should be now for it was never divided, but belonged to all. No tribe has a right to sell even to each other, much less to strangers sell a country why not sell the air, the great sea, as well as the earth? Did the great spirit not make them for all uh, for the use of all his children? How can we have confidence in white people? <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> well, I mean, that sounds like the diggers, right? That was this, mm -hmm. this early movement as they were, you know, privatizing land and selling it off as Britain was transitioning toward capitalism. You had, you know, St. George's Hill in Britain where the diggers emerged, right? And they were, they were a, a radical group. They called themselves the true levelers. And they went to St. George's Hill and they said, we no longer believe in the private ownership of land. We're going to build a peasant common, uh, peasant commune, actually. Um, and it was... Yeah, it was. It's wild. You look at the English Civil War. There was this weird uh, socialistic utopian breakaway among the peasantry that Oliver Cromwell uh, put down very brutally and murdered uh, murdered the people that were part of it. Uh, it's a very famous episode. And yeah, their their argument was uh, that that land couldn't be owned, owned privately. Um, you know, that's one. And it had a huge influ influence on socialism in Britain. Was a similar movement mm -hmm. because the, the seizing of land from the Native Americans. The clearing of the commons in Britain, this is all what Marx called primitive accumulation. It's the process through which feudal, feudalism transitioned to capitalism. It was a process of mass theft, right? Yeah. Mass theft, and which millions of people were, were reduced to being commodities, selling their labor, driven off the land they'd lived on for thousands of years, the clearing of the Scottish highlands. Uh, I mean, I mean the, 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 you know, the you know, rounding of the Cape, colonialism. This is this is the history of capitalism. Capitalism began with an episode of mass theft and genocide in every corner of the world in order to lay the basis for what it is now. So unless you want to conclude with anything, I think that's a good note to end on. Do you want to end with any thoughts for us, Brent? You know, I, I think one of the things that I was thinking about with regard to um, the debate and like how it eventually turned out, because. You know, the, the fact is, is that there are a lot of people who get hoodwinked by this very simplistic narrative of, oh, you can see race on people's faces, therefore, you know how they're going to act. You know, that, that's a comforting that's in a way it's like taking the blue pill. If you think about it, <laughs> you know, I know they like to, to lay claim over the red pill and stuff, but really like it's kind of a comforting story that people tell themselves to make themselves feel better and to erode the humanity of others. Because, you, you know, self doesn't exist without other. And sometimes like you can make yourself feel better by making someone else worse. Um, but I, I think ultimately, you know, when we see this, it just creates a very vicious cycle. I, I really hope that, you know. JF gets his head out of this awful stuff, you know, because um, I do think that it's like actively ruining his life. Um, and the, the fact that he has changed his environment and that he's kind of going off to homestead in Canada, I think that's wonderful. And I hope like, you know, dealing with the land and working and raising crops and stuff, I hope that will, will teach him not to hate so much. Um, but, you know, overall, what I think I, I just wanted to end with is I'm not sure if I'm going to do any more fascist debates. And there's there's a thing that I realized in the middle of this debate is even when you win the rules of formal debate, because it's like a person speaks for this long and then another person speaks for this long and there's no one fact checking them or anything. The, the fact is, is that like it is always easier to spew bullshit than to correct it. And um, there are always like when you do these debates. Now, the good thing is, is that you challenge these ideas. And I do, one of the reasons I did it is I wanted to make sure that people thought that these were ideas that could and should be challenged. Um, but at, at the same time, you know, I think it's something that if I ever do it again, I'm going to be very careful and very choosy about who I debate on that, because like, again, like he would make he would be all over the place and make like point, 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 point. And I could go in and destroy his argument overall. But then I go back at the debate and I'm like, Oh, I forgot to talk about this or, Oh, I forgot to talk about that. Like right. same yeah. feeling, same feeling when I debate. All right. Well, very good, Brent. All right. Talk to you soon.